Егор Чехов, Антон's paternal grandfather, was born as a serf in 1798 under Count Cherkov in the Voronish province, a region where the forests meet the steppes, halfway between Moscow and the Black Sea. Егор made sugar from beets and drove cattle to market. Hardworking and ruthless, he accumulated 875 rubles from a share of the profits, and in 1841 he bought himself, his wife, daughter and three sons out of serfdom and into the merchant class. Егор then moved his family 300 miles south to Kripkaya and became an estate manager to a Count Platov. One of Егор's sons, Pavel Chekhov, Anton's father, at the age of 16, moved to Taganrog on the Sea of Azov. There, he developed a passion for church music and became a merchant's shop boy. On one of Егор's visits, he beat Pavel so badly that Pavel suffered a hernia and had to wear a truss the rest of his life. At age 29, Pavel was married. Evgenia Morozova, Anton's mother, was introduced to Pavel by one of Anton's uncles, likely Pavel's brother and best friend Mitrofan, a senior shop boy who later became a well-liked merchant. Evgenia had beauty, but no dowry. Pavel's appeal as a future merchant compensated for his equine looks. Anton loved and pitied his mother. His father he deferred to, though detested. Pavel oscillated between heartless monster and callous humbug, yet portrayed himself as a self-sacrificing patriarch. Pavel and Evgenia had seven children, starting with Alexander, born in 1855 during the Crimean War. Two English ships had bombarded the Ganrog, destroying the cathedral, the port and many houses, prompting a pregnant Evgenia to flee hers, abandoning a chicken cooking in the oven. She fled to the steppes to stay with Igor Chekhov and gave birth to Alexander in the priest's house. When she returned, the family relocated to a tiny home belonging to Ephrosinia, Pavel's mother, where Evgenia gave birth to her second child, a son, Kolya, in 1858. Anton Chekhov was born January 16, 1860, old style, into a one-story house with a red wooden roof. The stay was brief, for the family moved again into the house of Mitrofan's father-in-law. In 1861, the fourth son, Vanya, was born. A daughter followed in 1863, Masha. In 1864 came another move, and in 1865 came the sixth child, a son named Misha. The seventh was born in 1869, a daughter, Evgenia. Taganrog's sandy soil made for poor foundations, and fresh water was hard to find, though its location on the sea made it a thriving port for wheat and beef transported by farmers down from the steppes. For Anton, in the first eight years of his life, every day in Taganrog became freer. During school holidays, he and Kolya would follow Alexander around town, catch fish in a smuggler's bay of Bogadonia, trap finches in a wasteland to sell for copics, and watch convict gangs catch stray dogs with hooks and club them to death. The brothers would come home in the evenings covered with lime and dust and mud. Pavel became a bad merchant and stubborn regent of the cathedral choir, refusing to shorten long hymns. Greek customers persuaded Pavel that prosperity lay with a job as a broker in a Greek trading firm. This induced Pavel to enroll Kolya and Anton to a Greek parish school. Anton had later said, In my childhood, I had a religious education and a religious upbringing. And the result? When I recall my childhood, I now find it rather gloomy. I now have no religion. The school had one large room with five long benches and one abusive teacher, Nicholas Vaudzinas similar to Dickens' character Wackford Squeers in Nicholas Nickleby. 
when Vaudzinus wasn't strapping a boy to a stepladder to be spit on by the class, he was disappearing to his private quarters, where a Ukrainian housekeeper met his needs. At the end of the year, Kolya and Anton could only recite the Greek alphabet and were promptly enrolled in the gymnasia, the Taganrog Grammar School. Anton's 11 years there liberated him from home life. Physical punishment was forbidden, a paradise compared to living under Pavel's roof. Anton learned that very few of his classmates were beaten at home and developed a quiet resistance to all authority, a core value of his adult personality. According to Anton, Tyranny and lies crippled our childhood so much that it makes me sick and afraid to remember. Remember the horror and revulsion we felt in those days when father would flare up because the soup was oversalted or would curse mother for a fool. At school, Anton was a mediocre student who constantly failed his Greek exams. Many of Anton's teachers met grotesque ends, such as dying of alcoholism and marrying women who ruined them, which in later life Anton used for his fiction. Pavel Vukov, the school disciplinarian, had said, Anton got on our nerves for nine years. But balance this summation with the fact that his ideas and witty phrases were taken up by his schoolmates, becoming a source of merriment and laughter. In 1869, the Chekhovs moved into a two-story brick house they rented at the edge of town. On the first floor was Pavel's shop, where he beat his shop boys and trained them to shortchange customers and pass off rotten goods as sound. On the second, he took in monks, Jews and school teachers as tenants in addition to his family. Pavel sold everything, from coffee and pen knives to flour and strychnine, the last an ingredient to an abortive patient called bird's nest, that Anton remarked must have dispatched many people to the next world. When Pavel found a drowned rat in a barrel of olive oil, he was too honest to say nothing, too miserly to pour the oil away, and too lazy to boil and refilter it. The store soon collapsed. The house itself, with its crowded bedrooms, kitchen without running water, no bath, and cockroach-infested backrooms, would hunt Anton's prose to his last story. In 1871, Anton's baby sister Evgenia died, an event that would affect his mother for the rest of her life. But even with one less mouth to feed, Pavel needed money. He rented stalls in the markets and had the 12-year-old Anton operate them with pitiful results. Summers were spent fishing from piles, driven into the shallow bed of the unfinished port and the stony beach of Bogudonia, where Anton cut his head diving into the water, giving him a scar. It's at this time that migraine and abdominal illness, then called Qatar of the stomach, befell young Anton. He thought of diarrhea and a constant cough as normal, an illness attributed to bathing in cold water. Although his uncle Vanya had died of tuberculosis and his aunt Fenichka and mother Evgenia had shown symptoms, nobody suggested that Anton might be afflicted too. Thankfully, his vitality fought off recurrent infection. In the summer of 1872, Pavel and Evgenia went on a pilgrimage around Russia to see monasteries and holy relics, and the children remained home and prospered. Alexander made electric batteries, Kolya painted, and Vanya bound books. Anton's older brothers got girlfriends, while Anton's wit and exquisite manners appealed to girls and women alike. His personality in public was that of tact and restraint. Anton stimulated his mind at the Taganrog Theater. Pupils were only allowed to visit after the inspector had approved the play. Pavel called the theater the gateway to hell, though Uncle Mitrofan attended regularly. The theater put on Shakespeare, French farce and Ostrovsky's beautifully constructed, realistic studies of the horror of merchant life, which Anton admired. In 1874, Pavel borrowed to buy stock at a bad time, 
Taganrog's commercial life was turned upside down. The new railway brought coal, wheat and wool from the steppes and cheap goods from Moscow, putting the small traders who supplied steppe farmers out of business. The writing was on the wall. In 1875, Pavel was expelled from the Second Guild of Merchants and demoted to a simple Mishanin. This meant a loss of privileges for him and his sons and left them open to military conscription if they failed to graduate university. Alexander and Kolya were sent to Moscow for secondary schooling. Meanwhile, Anton was invited by a family tenant, Gavriil Selivanov, to live with his brother, a notorious gambler, and his new wife, a rich widow. It was the first of four unforgettable occasions on which Anton went to live on a semi-savage Cossack ranch, where the livestock and Ukrainian peasants were terrorized by the incessant carousing and gunshots from the main house. Anton accepted the visit and after bathing in a cold river became so ill that the gambler panicked for the boy's life and drove him to a Jewish innkeeper who nursed him back to health. An event featured in his short story, Step, published 12 years later. The deadline for Pavel to repay his loan was fast approaching. For security, he had put up a house still under construction, which he planned to lease out to tenants half a mile away. The contractor Mironov had ripped Pavel off by making the walls too thick and charging for extra materials. At Easter 1876, Igor came from Kripkaya and held a family council. To avoid being thrown in debtor's prison, he advised Pavel to flee to Moscow. The loan deadline came and went. The guarantor, a merchant called Kostenko, paid 500 rubles to the bank and countersued Pavel. The contractor Mironov also sued for 1,000 rubles still owed to him in spite of the swindle. Pavel evaded both of them and his creditors and took the trip to Moscow by horse and cart. There, he lived with his two student sons. At age 16, Anton became head of the household. He dealt with creditors, debtors, relatives and friends whose sympathy was limited, while coping with his mother's misery and his younger siblings' dismay. The distress forged Anton's willpower and reserve. His grades steadily improved. He went to the theater and joined the library, reading the Moscow and Petersburg satirical weeklies and classics from Cervantes to Turgenev. However, at age 16, Anton could only do so much. An auction for the Chekhov house loomed on the horizon in order for the court to pay off Pavel's debt. Anton asked the tenant Gavriil Selivanov for help, and help he did. Selivanov made a deal with Mironov, Kostenko and the court. He paid Kostenko his 500 rubles and sold the Chekhov furniture to pay the interest. In effect, he bought the loan with the Chekhov house as security. Then Selivanov offered the Chekhovs to buy their house back from him, which they never did, though good relations between them persisted. In Moscow, Pavel was unemployable, and soon Evgenia, using Anton's earnings from selling household goods and tutoring fellow pupils, paid for three fares to Moscow. For her, Masha and Misha, leaving Anton and Vanya in Taganrog to fend for themselves. Anton moved in with one of Selivanov's relatives and Vanya with Aunt Marfa. Creditors stopped knocking, knowing they weren't going to get their money from two schoolboys. Anton as a tutor encountered his first love, Sasha Selivanova, whom he called Lady Bird because she wore a red dress with black spots. On one occasion, they were seen cooing like doves on a bench that overlooked the Ganrog's great flight of steps to the seashore. His flirtation, however, did not prevent Anton from tutoring effectively. Summers for the next three years were spent on the Selivanov family's ranches, where he kissed a peasant girl once by a well, rode stallions and killed dinner with shotguns. In school, he smoked, drank and got high marks in religion class. Students teased him with the name Pius Antosha, though he had lost his virginity at the Ganrog's brothel years earlier at age 13. 
By age 18, Anton was back in his old house with Silivanov's brother, niece and nephew, writing sketches and plays and sending them to his older brother Alexander. Alexander, who sometimes sent them to Moscow journals, delivered his feedback. Two scenes in fatherlessness are handled with genius even, but on the whole it's an unforgivable if innocent lie. The scythe strikes the stone is written in excellent language, which is very typical for each character developed, but your plot is very shallow. The letter, I said for convenience, was mine and read it to friends. The answer was, the writing is fine, it has skill, but little observation and no life experience. Anton researched the Russian anti-hero in Turgenev's essay Don Quixote and Hamlet, and in turn made his characters quixotic men of action who do not think, and cerebral Hamlets who do not act. However, it was medicine, not literature, that was Anton's career of choice. By age 19, Anton had lost all his grandparents and three of his uncles, and his brother Vanya had moved to Moscow to live with their parents. Anton was the sole family member left in Taganrog, where cemeteries haunted his dreams. But he kept focus. He knew what awaited him should he fail any of his exams. In March, he had to register at a Taganrog recruiting center. In May, he took his finals, passing everything but math. A vote was called by his teachers. They awarded him the passing grade. Taganrog's administration for the Mishani, or rather petite bourgeoisie, issued Anton a ticket of leave for Moscow to start medicine at Moscow University. In 1879, Anton reunited with his family in a basement flat on the Grachovka. At university, Anton continued friendship with other young men from Taganrog, also studying to be doctors, diving into inorganic chemistry, physics, mineralogy, botany, zoology and anatomy. For his writing, Anton sent a story Bored Philanthropists to the alarm clock and received not the usual acerbic rejection, but a polite one. He also wrote a parody of Pavel's and Yegor's pomposity and sent it to the Dragonfly, his first accepted story. When Anton visited Taganrog the following summer, he made an observation that preoccupied his mature prose. The enterprising, intelligent young man in town left for university, leaving the young women only with merchants or officials as potential grooms. Then. Anton brought back a human skull and displayed it prominently in his room on the Grachovka. His second year entailed dissecting corpses by day and studying pharmacology by night. On the National Front, Alexander II was assassinated in Petersburg. His son Alexander III took the throne. Censorship was the norm for newspapers and the public turned away from humorous pieces. Anton wrote a melodrama, Platonov his earliest surviving play, a precursor to the cherry orchard. A decaying estate is to be auctioned and nobody can save it, while mine shafts make ominous noises under the steps. Anton's third year at medical school introduced him to diagnostics, obstetrics and gynecology. Venereal diseases were central to the course. Prostitution at the time was regulated with inspections and treatment. A junior doctor could earn a good living. Ironic, since thus far in Moscow, Anton's girlfriends were nameless denizens of the red light district. But not exclusively for much longer. For the next 10 years, Anton and his brothers were to be involved with at least five trios of sisters. The first being Anna, Anastasia and Natalia Golden. For Anton's writing, a new magazine was being published, The Spectator. Its editor, Vsevolod Davidov, was saner than Kicheyev on the alarm clock and kinder than Vasilyevsky of the Dragonfly. He employed four of the Chekhov brothers, Alexander as editorial secretary, Kolya as an artist, Anton as a humorist, and Misha, an occasional translator and tea boy. Anton and Kolya caricatured townspeople in Taganrog, to the point they were not welcomed back. Anton's next target was Sarah Bernhardt, whom he declared histrionic and soulless. 
Also, Anton frequented nightclubs, such as the Salon de Verites, and published stories under pseudonyms should he ever be banned from returning. He did, however, make an attempt at literary renown with a story called The Lady, but this effort was riddled with clichés. Meanwhile, at the alarm clock, Alexander met secretary Anna Sokolnikova, who became his common-law wife and bore him three children. This, in addition to three children, she had from a previous marriage. She was the guilty party in a divorce and could not remarry, and for this she was not accepted by the Chekhov family. By now, in 1882, Evgenia was staying with Vanya, Masha and Misha in Voskresensk. Kolya and Anton were in a dacha owned by their editor Pushkarev, and Pavel spent overnights in Moscow working in Gavrilov's warehouse. Anton's fourth year required superhuman energy and determination. He trained in pediatrics, writing up the case of a doomed infant, paralyzed and postulant with neonatal syphilis, whom he tended for 12 weeks, while publishing almost 100 literary pieces. Livestock was about a lover settled with the husband of the woman he has seduced, and belated flowers about a patrician family fallen on hard times and a doctor of humble origins who flourishes. But to make a name for himself, Anton had to be printed in Petersburg. The 41-year-old poet Leodor Palmin was his foot in the door. Anton had met the tramp-like Palmin at the alarm clock. One day in October, when Palmin was dining with Nikolai Lekin, editor of the St. Petersburg weekly called Fragments, they spotted Anton and Kolya from their cab, and Palmin recommended them. By November, Lekin had accepted three out of five of the pieces Anton submitted. Lekin was a ruthless editor, rewriting contributions without consulting their authors, but won respect for his tenacity against the censors and drawing major writers to fragments. Though his boasting and pedantry became tiresome to Anton, Lekin commended admiration for his love of children and animals. Under Lekin's guidance, Anton began to show a telling, ironic turn of phrase and a gift for dialogue and imagery. Lekin allotted him a weekly column called Fragments of Moscow Life under the pen name Rover and later Ulysses. Anton was using editorial meetings at the alarm clock for material. Whenever Lekin lost subscribers, he blamed Anton and Palmin for their promiscuity. A new woman at this time entered Anton's life. Olga Kundasova, a gawky, strong-boned, highly strung kursistka who found work at the Moscow Observatory. More seductive was a temperamental, mordant Jewish student Dunya Afros. Both women were introduced to Anton by his sister Masha. Once the family crybaby, Masha became hostess, secretary, a perverse and protector of Anton's private life. Anton was in his ascendancy, while Alexander was half-forgotten in Taganrog, and Kolya was in a sordid Moscow tenement with tuberculosis, aggravated by alcohol, undermining his reputation as an artist. In Anton's final year at medical school, he had to write a full case history on nervous diseases. To graduate, he was required to retake every previous exam since year one, bringing the total exams to 75, plus course assessments, including an autopsy he performed at the police station. On June 16, 1884, Anton received his certificate of general practitioner, releasing him from military service and poll tax. As he paralleled his medical encounters in his fiction, he wanted to parallel this occasion as well. He collected six short stories into a book called Tales of Melpomene and ordered 1,200 copies from the printers. The book made him 500 rubles, 10 times what he made from Lekin a month prior. It also won critical attention. But to make a mark in Petersburg, Anton had to appear in person. He needed 100 rubles for fare and hotel, and Lekin did not think he was ready. Anton obeyed and instead opened the practice in Moscow to patients who pled poverty and paid him with pictures, foreign coins, and embroidered cushions. He also published his only novel, A Shooting Party, serialized in Moscow's sleazy News of the Day, or as Anton called it, Screws of the Day. 
Лекин recommended Антон to his own employer Худеков, editor of the prestigious Daily Petersburg newspaper, who in turn hired Антон to report on the Rykov fraud trial. While reporting in the courtroom, Антон had an ominous hemorrhage from his right lung. He knew it was tubercular. Later, at a spiritual seance, Turgenev's ghost apparently told Антон, your life is approaching its decline. To add to his woes, Kolya had stopped attending art school and turning in work for Lekin. He could only be contacted through Anna Golden. But how to get him away from her? Some family friends, the Kiselevs, offered the Chekhovs to live in a dacha for the summer in Babkina, in the country, to which they all agreed. The trap was set and Kolya showed up. Anton dared not to leave him, lest Kolya vanish back to wine, morphine and his girlfriend's bed. But when Anton filled in at a nearby hospital, Kolya bolted. The trip, however, allowed Anton to see the landscape through the eyes of his tubercular painter friend Isaac Levitan, while Alexei Kiselev tried to point out Anton's bodiness. The difference between my letters and yours, dear Anton, is that you can boldly read mine to young ladies, whereas I must throw yours into the stove as soon as I've read them, in case my wife catches sight of them. Babkina also provided material for a story, The Huntsman, about an unresponsive male and a frustrated female, failing to communicate while nature all around lives its own life. The story was to be Anton's entrance into Petersburg society. An old flame, Natalia Golden, had already left Moscow for Petersburg. She writes, Little bastard Antashevo, I could hardly bear the weight for your much-desired letter. I can feel you are having a merry, free-for-all time in Moscow. I invite you to my wedding. Today I can imagine you desperately flirting with Ephraim and Yunasheva. Who will win, I wonder? You scoundrel! Although Anton never responded, he was right behind her. In December 1885, Lekin brought Anton to stay for a fortnight in Petersburg, introducing him to the elderly novelist Grigorovich, doyen of living Russian writers, the newspaper tycoon and publisher Suvorin, and his vitriolic lead writer Viktor Burenin. The literati gave Anton a cool reception, do more to Lekin's presence than Anton's. But to Lekin's credit, he did agree to publish another collection of Anton's, titled Motley Stories. And Anton did make a friend, Viktor Bilibin, Lekin's lead writer. Bilibin warned Anton that Lekin had no intention of letting him escape Moscow. A flurry of weddings that winter turned Anton's thoughts to marriage. The notion was to preoccupy him for the next 15 years. His behavior was that of the character Pakalesin in Gogol's comedy Marriage. Pakalesin, when finally confronted with the betrothal he seeks, he jumps out of the window. For a time, Anton became secretly engaged to Dunya Ephras. Her violent spirit attracted and repelled him and would infiltrate the highly sexed and assertive heroines of his stories that year. Between orthodoxy and Judaism, neither was willing to convert. A letter from Dunya, which came four months after the breakup, followed Natalia's trend of commentary. I was thinking of a rich bride for you, Anton. Even before I had your letter. There's a very lovely merchant's daughter here. Not bad looking, rather plump, your taste, and fairly daft, also a virtue. In the new year 1886, Kurepin of the alarm clock returned from Petersburg with word that press baron Alexei Suvorin wanted Anton's stories for new times. Anton accepted with glee. Before publication of his short story Requiem, Suvorin telegrammed Anton to ask to use his real name. Prior to this, Anton had reserved his real name for scientific writing. Reluctantly, though, Anton consented and Antosha Chihonte was history. Suvorin increased his pay from Lekin's eight copics a line to twelve and expanded Anton's word count from one thousand to three. Anton had divined Suvorin's tastes. 
brooding sexuality and graphic naturalism were encapsulated in his next story, Agafia. The tale was of the heroine Agafia, who is beaten by her husband after a day with her lover. Writers like Grigorovich and Suvorin struck a filial chord in Anton. He responded with trusting affection to literary father figures, while Suvorin responded with candor, sensing genius and delicacy. Anton was frank with Suvorin as with no one else. Suvorin rose up the ranks from teacher to journalist, critic and playwright. He was a radical in the 1860s and friends with Dostoevsky. His paper New Times was widely read, admired and detested. Suvorin was witty, though not humorous. He feared only death and a rival newspaper. He was to offer employment to Alexander, Vanya, Masha and Misha. In Babkina that summer, the painter Levitan proposed to Masha. She would refer all proposals to Anton and always receive a strong negative signal. Anton never forbade her to marry, but his silence and actions behind the wings left her in no doubt how much he disapproved. In Moscow, the Chekhovs rented a two-story brick house with eight rooms on the west side of the Moscow Garden Ring, where they spent the next four years. It was the only Chekhov residence in Moscow to be made into a museum. Anton called it the chest of drawers. He began spending more than what he earned. Alexander's alcoholism and Kolya's TB weighed on his shoulders, and a critic at Northern Herald ridiculed his latest collection, In the Twilight, that Suvorin had just published. Anton fell into gloom. He wrote a letter to Alexander so suicidal that Alexander destroyed it telling him to ignore the lies about his work. Back to the grindstone, Anton wrote a play. He had made fun of a preposterous drama at Korsh's theater, and Korsh challenged him to write one himself. The result was Ivanov, the title, a ploy to drive an audience to the theater, as Ivanov was a common surname. The character Ivanov spends all four acts in manic depression, he falls for the daughter of his creditors, a Jewish girl dying of TB, and shoots himself at the end. Some critics went for the jugular, while others praised it enough to guarantee that it toured the provinces. The disapproval incited in Anton a love-hate relationship with drama. Nonetheless, his prose work led Suvorin to raise Anton from 12 to 20 copics a line at New Times. And Yevriinova, the editor at the Northern Herald, gave Anton carte blanche on length, subject and fee. By 1888, Anton used this newfound freedom to write the masterpiece novella titled Steppe, and the Chekhov family never knew poverty again. But they did no pain. Alexander's partner Anna died of TB, and one of Suvorin's sons of diphtheria. Anton spent that summer visiting Suvorin's villa in Feodosia and traveled with another son nicknamed the Dauphin to the Caucasus, turning around when they received word of the other son's death. Alexander found a new love in one of Anton's old ones, Natalia Golden. Anton did not respond to Natalia's revelatory letter declaring her new relationship, but did confide to Suvorin that he had tuberculosis. He and Anton spoke of everything from literature to sex, sometimes both. When Suvorin praised Zola's expertise at writing sex, Anton replied angrily. I have seen quite a few wayward women and have seen it many times personally, but I don't believe Zola or that lady who told you one bum and it's done. Dissipated people and writers like to make out their gourmets and fine connoisseurs of fornication. They're daring, decisive, inventive. They have sex 33 different ways on virtually everything but a knife edge. But all that is just talk. In fact, they have sex with their cooks and go to one ruble's brothels. I have never seen a single decent apartment where circumstances would allow you to topple a woman dressed in a corset, skirts and a proper dress onto a chest or divan or the floor and have sex with her without servants noticing. All these terms for doing it standing up, sitting down and so on are nonsense. 
the easiest way is on a bed, and the other 33 are difficult and visible only in a hotel room or a shed. If Zola had sex on tables, under tables, on fences, in dog kennels, in mail coaches, or saw with his own eyes others doing so, then trust his novels. But if he wrote on the basis of rumors and friends' stories, then he was hasty and careless. Anton had rumors of his own spreading through Petersburg, that he was betrothed to Sibirikova, a millionaire widow, or that he would marry Suvorin's 11-year-old daughter one day. People gossiped, calling Suvorin the Dauphin and Anton the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. As to why Anton wasn't married, he pled poverty. While he didn't personally have a stable relationship, he did look after his brothers. He scolded Alexander for being drunk and abusive towards Natalia Golden, then visited Kolya and Anna Golden. TB had struck Kolya's intestines. Anton diagnosed typhoid and put a hold on his writing to rescue his brother. Anton brought Kolya to Sumy, where the family summered, and gave him creosote, ipecacuana, and menthol. A reformed Alexander arrived with the children and Natalia, and for one hour, all five Chekhov brothers were together again. But after two harrowing months on duty, sleeping in the room next to Kolya, Anton suddenly snapped. He took the carriage to see some family friends 100 miles away in Poltava, leaving Alexander alone to nurse Kolya. Alexander explains. As I drove up to the manor house, I met Anton in the courtyard. Then Masha, Vanya and Misha came onto the porch. Mama met us in the hall and began kissing her grandchildren. Have you seen Kolya? Vanya asked me. I went into the room and saw that instead of the old Kolya, a skeleton was lying there. He was horribly emaciated. His cheeks had sunk, his eyes fallen in and shining. To the last, he didn't know he had TB. Anton hid it from him, and he thought he just had typhoid. Brother, said Kolya, stay with me. I'm an orphan without you. I'm alone all the time. Mother, brothers and sister come to see me, but I'm alone. When I lifted him from the bed onto the pot, I was always afraid that I might break his legs. The next morning I went crayfishing in the river, not for the crayfish, but to get strength for the next night. In 1889, the death of Kolya shook Anton to the core. Facing his own mortality and not yet 30, Anton became restless and could not stay in one place more than a month. In Luka, he met Cleopatra Karatigina, the only older woman in Anton's life. Cleopatra, at age 41, was neither sociable nor pretty. Known as Beetle, she was an actress at the Mali Theatre. She was homeless, widowed young, and she understood Anton's unhappiness. Antony and Cleopatra became the talk of the town. Frequently on the move, though, Anton set off for the Crimea, missing Alexander and Natalia's wedding. In Yalta, a precocious 15-year-old Yelena Shavrova accosted Anton in a cafe. She had written a story titled Sophie about a Georgian prince's love for Sophie's mother. Anton rewrote it, making the prince in love with Sophie. Thus began Anton's informal lessons in creative writing. His next student was a 24-year-old aspiring writer, Ilya Gurliand, to whom he gave some rules for drama. Things on stage should be as complicated and yet as simple as in life. People dine, just dine, while their happiness is made and their lives are smashed. If in Act 1 you have a pistol hanging on the wall, then it must fire in the last act. There is nothing harder than to write a good farce. In Moscow, Cleopatra reconnected with Anton, as well as his other lady friends, Olga Kundasova, Natalia Lintvadiva and Alexandra Pakhlebina. The last so passionate towards Anton that it later exploded into paranoia. 
Маша also introduced a new friend, Лидия Мизинова, whom they called Лика. She was described as a real swan princess from the Russian fairy tale. Her ash blonde flowing locks, her wonderful gray eyes and sable eyebrows, her extraordinary softness and elusive charm, combined with total absence of affection and an almost severe simplicity, made her spellbinding. Lika's mother was a concert pianist, and Lika's father deserted the family when she was three. She wanted to be an actress, but was frustrated by stage fright. In November 1889, the Northern Herald was saved by Anton's a dreary story. The tale concerns the existentialism of a man dying in a world from which he is totally alienated. While the work was lauded, Anton's next play was not. The Wood Demon, a collaboration between Anton and Suvorin, was clumsy and obscure, and at the premiere in 1889 the audience booed. By the end of the year, Anton had resolved to make a long journey, from which he thought he might not return, over Siberia to the edge of the Russian Empire, to the island of Sakhalin, Russia's grimmest penal colony. The trip was partially inspired by Nikolai Prizhevalsky, an explorer that had recently passed away. Anton met with the director of prisons to make sure the gates would be opened for him when he arrived. The announcement was praised in the press, silencing accusations that Anton was indifferent to the suffering he portrayed. Fortified by three glasses of Santorini wine, in April 1890, Anton took the train to Yaroslavl, then a riverboat down the Volga and up the Kama into the Urals. He left Evgenia, Masha and Lika weeping at the station, while Vanya and Anton's friends stayed on the train as far as Kinishma. When his friends got off, Anton was alone. America had been joined coast to coast for 20 years, but Russia had no Trans-Siberian Railway. Anton took the train to Tumeny through furious blizzards. There, he hoped to board a ship down the Tobol River, but it was obstructed by ice. Instead, he bought a cart, hired horses, and braved 1,000 miles overland to Tomsk. The journey made him bruised, wet, cold, and exhausted. At one point, Anton's Troika was in a head-on collision with another cart. Anton writes, We veer right, it veers left. We are colliding flashes in my head. One instant and a crushing sound. The horses entangle in a black mass. My cart is on its rear. I tumble to the ground. All my suitcases and bundles on top of me. I leap up and see a third troika. My mother must have been praying for me last night. If I had been asleep or the third troika had come straight after the second, I'd have been crushed to death or crippled. I feel a complete loneliness that I have never known before. It was the coldest May in Siberia for almost 40 years. Geese and ducks were the only signs of spring. In Tomsk, Anton steeled his reserves and geared up for another 1,100 miles to Irkutsk. His family, whom he rode home to, had lost its center of gravity and scattered. Through Irkutsk, he took a small boat across Lake Baikal, made Stretinsk, and boarded a steamboat called the Yermak to travel the Amu River. By the end of June, he reached Blagoveshensk, free and warm, bewitched by Chinese traders and Japanese girls. After a visit to the local brothel, he moved on to Aigun, down the Amur, and to the ocean at Nikolaevsk. The ship Baikal stopped offshore of Sakhalin and Anton was rowed to the island. The landmass was a hilly sliver of Arctic tundra. For half the year, the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius. The other half is chilly, foggy and rainy. Sakhalin had 10,000 prisoners, 10,000 guards and family, and a few thousand aborigines. At first, the officials denied they knew of Anton's journey. Then General Vladimir Kananovich stepped in and promised full cooperation. Anton got to work distributing cards to exiles and prisoners to record statistics. 
He also wrote down his conversations, witnessed floggings, and treated the sick while hiding his indignation. The island's hospitals had no scalpels or medicine, and the schools no textbooks. Anton wired Suvorin and Vanya to send books and programs. In October, disillusioned by humanity, he began his journey home via Hong Kong. Evgenia and Misha intercepted the train at Tula. Misha writes, We found Anton dining in the station restaurant with midshipman Glinka and a strange-looking man, an aborigine with a broad, flat face and narrow, slanting eyes. This was the chief priest of Sakhalin, monk priest Irakli. As they ate, a pair of mongooses stood on their hind legs and kept picking at their plates. The mongooses Anton had brought from India, one of which stayed with the Chekhovs for some time. The family named him Sod. He dug up houseplants and scrabbled in Pavel's beard. Mentally, though, Anton had changed. Sakhalin had destroyed his respect for authority. Anton was also suffering from hemorrhoids, but it didn't stop his social life. An actress, Daria Musina Pushkina, one of Masha's circle, wrote to him. Listen, cockroach, I couldn't resist the temptation and am coming to Svobodin's. I won't deny that I'd very much like you to come and fetch me, not me fetch you. But I know how stubborn you are. Daria was not alone. Lika wanted Anton as well, body and soul. His responses to her were always ironic, never passionate or jealous. But their frequency, length and extravagance betray the disturbing effect Lika had on him. Anton writes, As for your coughing, stop smoking and don't chatter in the street. If you die, Trofim will shoot himself and Spotiface will get puperal convulsions. I'll be the only one glad of your death. I hate you so much that just the memory of you is enough to make me utter sounds like your granny. Uh, uh, uh. I'd gladly scold you with boiling water. Misha's friend Yelena Shavrova writes to tell me things are bad. I'm seriously thinking of leaving for Australia. You to the Aleutian Islands, she to Australia. Where am I to go? You've grabbed the better half of the earth. Farewell, villainous of my heart, your well-known writer. His next excursion was a trip to Europe with Suvorin and the Dauphine on the Petersburg-Vienna Express. In Venice, Desdemona's house and Canova's tomb sent Anton into ecstasy. In Monte Carlo, Anton lost 800 francs. In Paris, he celebrated Easter in a Russian Orthodox church. When he returned, the Chekhovs and Sod the Mongoose rented a dacha near Alexin on the river Aka. Trains crossed a rickety bridge nearby. Sod broke the crockery and uncorked bottles. Anton wrote, Writing. I'm like a crayfish sitting in a trap with other crayfish. Lika's flirtation with the painter Levitan finally flushed Anton out. Lika and Levitan both came to visit, though Anton responded with more irony. The family soon decamped for Bagimova, another summer retreat, and Sod vanished in the move. Anton writes Lika. Golden, mother of pearl, filled the course Lika. The mongoose ran away the day before yesterday and will never ever return. He's kicked it. Come and sniff flowers, catch fish, go for walks and howl. Oh, fair Lika, when you watered my right shoulder with your howling tears, I've removed the stains with benzene and ate our bread in big slices and our beef, we were greedily devouring your face and the back of your neck. Instead of Lika, it was Levitan who replied to Anton. Everything, beginning with the air and ending, God forbid me, with the most insignificant bog on earth, is imbued with the divine Lika. She isn't here yet, but she will be, for she doesn't love you. The tow-haired, but me, the volcanic, dark-haired man, and she will only go where I am. It hurts you to read this, but love of truth prevents me from hiding the fact. We have settled in Tver province, near the estate of Panafidin. <laughs> 
I'm a sheer psychopath. You will find it interesting if you come. Wonderful fishing and our rather nice company, consisting of Sophia, me, the friend and the Vestal Virgin. Anton felt deserted, first by the mongoose, then by Lika. An artist friend, Sofia Kuvshinnikova, writes Anton. I don't understand how you could let this little foreign mongoose go to his doom. I'm beginning simply to think that you, Chekhov, were terribly envious of its popularity and so neglected your rival on purpose. Masha left next. Anton focused and divided his time. On Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, he wrote The Island of Sakhalin, a non-fiction piece. On Thursdays, Fridays and Saturdays, he wrote The Duel, a short story about two heroes, one with a faintly Polish name, Lajewski, the other distinctly Germanic, von Koren. Both heroes preach a set of ideas, one lazily Slavonic, the other maniacally Germanic, and they fight a duel. The novelty of the story is that Anton's sympathies lie with neither set of ideas, even though he loves both his characters. On the other side of the river Aka, hunters found an animal hiding in a crack in a quarry and recognized it as Anton Chekhov's lost mongoose. Anton quickly recovered poor Sad and had him donated to a zoo. Masha went to visit him. Anton was desperate to quit Moscow. On his behalf, Misha bought the estate in Melikhova for 13,000 rubles. It was 600 acres of birch woods and pasture, with a small wooden house and outbuildings. The Chekhovs had become cattle farmers. In March 1892, Anton felt like Cincinnatus, who left Rome to till the soil. The best room in the L-shaped manor house was designed as Anton's study. Pavel, Evgeny and Masha refurbished the house. They had three horses starving on straw, and one mare was the sole transport. The pond was a cesspit, the water supply a dilapidated stirrup pump. The family made Misha farm manager, who hired cooks, maids and a driver for the freshly bought horses. At first, the peasants resisted, but when Anton set up a free clinic, visited the bedridden and gave them the right to cut hay in his forest, they came to accept him. The usual friends came to visit in the summer, Olga, Lika and Alexandra. In February, before Anton bought Melikhova, there had been a famine. By July, after he settled in, came a cholera epidemic. Anton believed the illness was being sensationalized. Nevertheless, he offered the Serpukhov Health Commission to man a village clinic. Anton visited 25 villages, checking sanitation, treating dysentery, worms, syphilis, and TB, falling into bed exhausted every night. The cholera never came to Melikhova, but Anton's volunteer work sucked him into committees. He had little time to harvest. The geese and cows held themselves to the cabbage field. In January 1893, after a three years evasion, Anton climbed the apartment steps in Moscow to see Lika. She then visited Melikhova, but failed to lure Anton to Moscow permanently. Vanya, however, now head teacher at Basmania school, got engaged to a fellow teacher, Sofia Andreeva. Misha, who resumed his job as tax collector, got engaged to Countess Mamuna, leaving Anton the only brother left single. Not to be outdone, Anton soon received his heart's desire, two dachshunds, promised by his old editor Nikolai Lekin. Anton named them Brom and Quinine. They spent their days chasing geese and hens out of the garden. It was time to get back to work. The Chekhovs were up from dawn till dusk, plowing and sowing. Anton also got busy seeing patients, people with sores, wounds, mental illness, TB, scarlet fever and measles. Meanwhile, the Dauphin was gaining power in Suvorin's empire and asked Anton to revise Alexander's writing for new times. Anton, siding with Alexander, refused. The Dauphin's attempt to sow discord among the brothers had failed. His motive was likely to fire Alexander. By October 1893, Russian thought began serializing the island of Sakhalin. Despite its lack in quality, it earned Chekhov esteem. He was now a conscience for the nation. 
in Moscow, Anton jumped back into the social scene. He was nicknamed Happy Avalon after the Russian admiral who was recently received by friends in Bakik hospitality to celebrate the new Franco-Russian alliance. Two women entered Anton's life at this time. The first was Tanya Shepkina Kupernik, a 19-year-old verse translator and sapphic love poet. She charmed women too and was in a love affair with 23-year-old actress Lydia Lavorska. Anton's expeditions to theaters and restaurants and long sessions in hotel rooms were fueled by the passion between Tanya and Lydia. On the Lika front, a musician named Ignati Potapinka began to court her, which Anton allowed. Lika held out hope, she writes. Dear Anton, I have something important to ask you. When I was in Melihova, I forgot my cross and I feel very bad without it. For God's sake, tell Anuta to have a look and then you wear it and bring it to me. You must wear it. Or else you will lose it or forget it some other way. Come and see me, uncle. And don't forget about me. Your Lika. Anton expressed a hint of regret, though took no action, and Lika and Patapinka conceived a child. The couple moved to Paris, where Potapinka juggled time between Lika and his consumptive wife. Anton's circle appeared to be regrouping in Paris, including Tanya, Lydia and Levitan, but he instead traveled to Yalta, then returned to Melikova to make hay. Potapinka paid a visit, gave his side of the story, and together with Anton went on a trip to the Volga. Saint George, instead of rescuing the maiden, was off with the dragon. They went to Taganrog, but failed to see Uncle Mitrofan, who died shortly thereafter. Lika moved to Switzerland for her health and gave birth to a daughter. Potapinka never met Lika again. For the time being, both were frozen outside of Anton's circle. Tanya and Lydia, however, drew Anton into their whirlpool from Melikova to Moscow, where Anton settled into room number one in the Great Moscow Hotel and wrote the novella Three Years. The tale was disturbingly naturalist and autobiographical in its evocation of the haberdashery firm Laptiv & Sons, from which the hero breaks free. However, Laptiv is not Anton, but his introversion and revulsion against his merchant heritage. Upon completion, Anton touched base with everyone. Olga Kundasova wrote him suffering from dementia in Mishirska, where she was a patient. Anton dined with the sober Alexander and Natalia, and Anton and Suvorin renegotiated his pay to 200 rubles monthly. Anton then reached out to someone new, Lydia Avilova, a children's writer in Petersburg who became a deluded admirer. Avilova ordered a medallion inscribed with the title of one of Anton's books, a page and a line number. Anton duly found the reference. If you ever need my life, come and take it. He decided to use the medallion as the final touch to his new play, The Seagull, the cruelest of modern comedies. The seagull's shot bird symbolizes youth destroyed and was aimed at Henrik Ibsen's wild duck. The young writer Treplev, jealous of his mother's lover, parodies Hamlet and Gertrude. The middle-aged actress Arkadina, who holds all the men in thrall, including her brother Sorin, her son Treplev, and her lover Trigorin, caricatures every actress that Anton had ever disliked and echoes Lydia Lavorska's mannerisms, such as kneeling before Anton and calling him My only one. The boring school teacher Medvedenko mimics Mikhailov, a real teacher in the village of Talej near Melikova. The medallion that Nina gives Trigorin with the coded reference Max Lydia Avilova. The lakeside setting of the play, the pointless killing of the seagull, and Treplev's first attempt to shoot himself all commemorate Levitan, who recently botched a suicide attempt. The unhappy fate of Nina 
adored by Treplev and seduced by Trigorin, reflects the story of Lika, Anton and Potapenko. Lika and Potapenko's involvement with the Chekhovs was not over. Masha invited Lika to Melikhova, and Anton devised a suitable penance for Potapenko. He would hire a typist to make copies of the play. Anton then also built a new school for the villagers. While all this was going on, in August 1895, Anton traveled southwest of Tula to meet a writer greater than himself, Leo Tolstoy. Anton stayed at the writer's home at Yasnaya Poliana for three days, even though a private talk with Tolstoy was no more feasible than with the Pope. Access to him was controlled by his disciple, Chertkov, who also happened to be grandson of the man who had owned Anton's grandfather. Anton had an audience, not a conversation with Tolstoy. Chertkov, in the master's presence, read from Tolstoy's unpublished novel, Resurrection, to which Anton pointed out the heroine's implausibly light sentence for conspiracy to murder. Tolstoy had read Chekhov's prose and praised many of his stories, though not for the same reason Anton liked them. Tolstoy deplored Anton's lack of guiding idea. Anton's person, however, charmed the old writer, in particular his young lady's gait. Anton felt admiration for the man, largely because he saw how much Tolstoy's daughters loved their father, and because Anton believed that a mistress, wife or a mother could be deceived, but a daughter could not. One of the daughters, Tatiana, it turned out developed feelings for Anton. She writes, Today Papa read Chekhov's new story, The House with the Mezzanine, and I had an unpleasant feeling because I sensed the reality in it, and because the heroine was a 17-year-old girl. Now, Chekhov is a man to whom I could become wildly attached. Nobody has penetrated my soul at the first encounter as he has. On Sunday, I walked to the Petrovskys and back to see his portrait. And I've only seen him twice in real life. Anton chose not to respond to her desire for another visit. In spring 1896, Tsar Nicholas II was to be crowned in Moscow. Pavel and Suvorin separately watched the five-hour coronation in the Uspensky Cathedral. 150 stands were erected in Hadinka Field for the celebration. 700,000 people were offered presents, a tin mug and coronation sausage, with the lure of a special price, a silver watch at each stand. On May 18th, a stand collapsed in a stampede. Suvorin went to Hadinka after the accident and writes, Up to 2,000 people were crushed to death. Corpses were being carted all day, and the crowd went with them. It's a rutted place with pits. The police arrived only at nine, and people had started gathering at two. There were a lot of children. They were lifted up and saved over people's heads and shoulders. On June 1st, Suvorin had Anton join him to see the graves. Suvorin writes, Chekhov and I were at the Vagankovo cemetery a week after the catastrophe. The graves still smelt. The crosses were in rows like soldiers on parade, mostly six-cornered pine. A long pit had been dug, and the coffins were placed next to each other in three layers. The mass grave affected Anton so profoundly, he did not answer Lika's request to see her. Viktor Goltsev at Russian Thought was now her second fiddle, as Yelena Shavrova was to Anton. His next letter to Lika ended with a telling remark. I can't tie up and untie my affairs any more easily than I can tie a necktie. The words tie up and untie, завязывать and развязывать, connect Anton's love life to his writing. For the words also mean to devise a plot and to devise the end of the plot. The concept of a plot is exactly what the Imperial Theatre Committee was looking for in his play. Of the seagull, they found scenes haphazardly thrown on paper with no proper connection to the whole, without dramatic consequentiality. Despite their disdain, they passed the play for performance. 
on the morning of opening night, Masha writes. Sullen and stern, Anton met me at the Moscow station. Walking down the platform, coughing, he said, the actors don't know their parts. They understand nothing. Their acting is horrible. Only Commissar Zhevska is good. The play will flop. You shouldn't have come. Masha took her seat in the box that night. She writes, From the very first minute I sensed the public's indifference and ironic attitude to what was happening on stage. When, later in the act, the curtain rose on the inner stage and Commissar Zhevska, who was acting very hesitantly that night, appeared wrapped in a sheet and began her monologue, people, lions, eagles, grouse, you could hear open laughter, loud conversation, sometimes hissing in the audience. I felt cold inside. Finally, a real scandal broke out. At the end of Act One, thin applause was drowned by hissing, whistles, offensive remarks about the author and the performers. I sat it out in my box to the end. Anton entered the director's office, his lips blue, his face frozen in a grimace, and said in a barely audible voice, The author has flopped. Anton then vanished into the freezing streets of Petersburg. He walked to Romanov's restaurant, ate alone, and went to Suvorin's house. He spoke to nobody, crawled into bed and pulled the blanket over him. When Suvorin found him, Anton declared, if I live another 700 years, I won't let the theater have another play. While Anton slept, Lydia Avilova tossed and turned. She had seen the play and her medallion therein, but the coded page and line number had been changed. She picked up the Chekhov volume from which she had originally encoded her line, but the new message made no sense. Only in the early hours of the morning did it dawn on her that Anton might have encoded one of her own books of stories. He had. She found the page and the line number. It read, Young ladies should not go to balls. Rebuffed, she went back to bed. Anton licked his own wounds back in Melikhova. His brother Alexander praised Anton's play as being full of deep psychology, thoughtful and heart-rending. Even Lydia Avilova came to defend it, forgiving Anton for his dirty trick with her medallion. Masha and Lika took the overnight express and nursed Anton through what he called flu. Lika left with his renewed affections and a new dachshund. Reassured Anton was not going to hang himself. Tragically, the parallels between real life and Anton's play did not end on the stage. The character Nina's baby had died, and so too did Likas. The news made Anton put off his journey to Moscow by a day or so. At the Great Moscow Hotel, Likas stayed with him, and he prescribed her a sedative. When she left, Yelena Shavrova, now married, arrived with the manuscript leaving a chaperone in her carriage. After a biblical seven years, the inevitable happened in the hotel room. The dear Master Anton became the schemer, as she put it. When Yelena came to her senses and asked the time, Anton's watch had stopped. When Lika next came to Melikhova, she was distressed to learn she was being superseded by others in Anton's affections. A fire also broke out in the house between the stove and the wall. A local priest and Prince Shekhovskoy, a neighbor, helped the family put it out. Fortunately, Melikhova was surrounded by ponds and Anton owned a fire engine. Moreover, Anton and Masha had insured everything from the house to the cows. By 1897, Actress Lyudmila Ozerova, Yelena Shavrova, Vera Komisarzhevskaya and Lydia Vilova all called for Anton. Masha wrote to him, joking. Give my regards to all the ladies who are visiting you. Alexander wrote. I hear you spent a long time in Moscow and led a life of fornication, the buzz of which has even reached Petersburg. 
the painter Levitan dying of TB called on Anton too, but Anton had troubles of his own. In March, he took his room in the Great Moscow and in the evening went to dine with Suvorin at the Hermitage. Before they had begun to eat, Anton clutched his napkin to his mouth and pointed at the ice bucket. Blood was gushing up uncontrollably from his lung. He held the bucket to his blood-stained shirt in the cab ride to Suvorin's suite at the Slav Bazaar and fell onto a bed, saying, Blood's coming from my right lung. It did with my brother and my mother's sister. Dr. Abalonsky was summoned but could not persuade Anton to go to the hospital. Anton sent a note to his footman at the Great Moscow to send the proofs of his short story Peasants and tell only Vanya his whereabouts. The hemorrhage did not abate until morning. Anton was calm, though afraid, but his friends panicked. Five days later, Anton relented, and Abalonsky took him straight to Professor Astraumov's clinic. Astraumov, who had taught Anton in medical school, treated him with ice packs, peace and nutrition, until the threat of fatal hemorrhage receded. Anton was carefully watched, since doctors were unruly patients. Masha, Vanya, Lydia, Vilova, Yelena Shavrova and Suvorin visited. When Yelena came, she found Anton choosing new lenses for a pince The year before, he had seen an optician who cured his headaches. His short-sighted right eye had been trained by the long-sighted left. After Lydia Vilova's visit, she wandered the Novodevich cemetery and bumped into Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy visited Anton at once. Of the visit, Anton wrote, We talked about immortality. Tolstoy recognizes it in a Kantian sense. He supposes that we shall all, people and animals, live in a principle, a reason, love whose essence and aims are a mystery to us. But I see this principle of force as something like a shapeless mass of aspic, my ego, my individuality and mind will merge with this mass. I don't want this immortality. Fifteen days after the hemorrhage began, it abated. Four days after that, Russian thought published peasants. Never was Anton so faded by the intelligentsia. His hospital trip had been widely publicized. Still suffering, Vanya took Anton south to Melikhova. At the end of the month, Anton stopped his arsenic injections, shed his practice of medicine, and decided to go into exile at summer's end. His destination, Biarritz, where he stayed in the Hotel Victoria. Biarritz, Russians complained, was crowded with Russians. The president of France had visited Russia in August 1897. A clause in the new Franco-Russian alliance forbade the French post to accept packages printed in Cyrillic, to protect Russia from seditious literature. Anything that Anton wrote or proofread had to be a letter on thin paper. For months his creative outlet was a notebook, in which fragments of dialogue, characterization and plot were mingled with addresses and lists of plans for the garden. Another political event occurred in the fall of 1897. The French government was forced to reopen the Dreyfus case. In 1894, the Jewish officer Alfred Dreyfus had been sentenced to life imprisonment on Devil's Island for betraying French military secrets to Austro-Hungarian intelligence. Anton admired Zola's article titled GQ's Defending Dreyfus. Anton's fondness for Jews was rather like his fondness for women even though to his mind no Jew could ever fully enter into Russian life and no woman ever equal a male genius, he vigorously defended their rights to equal opportunities. In spring, Anton traveled to Paris and met Matthew Dreyfus, Alfred's brother. Anton thought of seeing Zola too, but Anton did not trust his ability to speak French. Suvorin oversaw Anton's departure from Paris and his wife Anton's arrival in Moscow. In Melikhova, Anton received a letter from director Vladimir Nimirovich Danchenko. He had merged his best six actors, including Konstantin Stanislavsky, into the Moscow Art Theater, the first private theater to rival Russia's officially subsidized state theaters. 
Владимир and his brother Vasily had their own rivalry, in that whatever Vasily attacked, Vladimir defended. Vasily attacked Anton's play The Seagull, so naturally Vladimir championed the play and its author. At first, Anton refused Vladimir's call to revive it in Moscow, in spite of The Seagull's performances in other cities. Vladimir writes, What's worrying you? Stay away from first performances, that's all. Can you forbid the play ever to be put on in Moscow, when it can be acted anywhere without your permission? Even in Petersburg? Send me a note to say you have no objection to my staging the seagull, unless you are hiding the simplest one that you don't believe I can stage the play well. Anton gave in. He arrived in September 1898 for the first rehearsal. It was a revelation. Weeks of hard work had gone into discussions with the cast, and Anton found himself a longed-for oracle, not a nuisance and his interest in theater revived once again. The actress Olga Knipper noticed him at the rehearsal and wrote, We were all taken by the unusually subtle charm of his personality, of his simplicity, his inability to teach, show. When Anton was asked a question, he replied in an odd way, as if it attentioned, as if in general, and we didn't know how to take his remarks. Seriously, or in jest? Anton writes of Olga about her portrayal of Irina in the rehearsal of the play Tsar Fyodor. Irina, I think, is splendid. The voice, the nobility, the depth of feeling is so good that I have a lump in my throat. If I had stayed in Moscow, I should have fallen in love with this Irina. For winter, Anton sojourned in the Crimea. He was in a romantic mood. He stopped at Sevastopol while awaiting the boat to Yalta and was befriended by a military doctor who took him to the moonlit cemetery. Here, Anton overheard a woman telling a monk, Go away if you love me. In Yalta, Anton's mood persisted. Olga Knieper was on his mind. Breaking in on this reverie was the death of Pavel. Pavel had lifted a 20-pound bag of sugar without wearing the truss for his hernia. As he straightened up, a loop of gut was pinched by his abdominal muscles, which led to symptoms of gangrene. Pavel died on the operating table. Anton saw Pavel's death as the end of an era. Anton wrote his journalist friend Mikhail Menshikov. The main cock has jumped out of the Melikova machine. And I think that life in Melikova for my mother and sister has now lost all its charm and that I shall now have to make a new nest for them. Masha was greeted by Anton in Yalta with news he was building a new house at Autka. Their brother Misha heard about the buy and writes Anton. Buy an estate, marry a good person, but definitely get married, have a baby. That is happiness one can only dream about. On December 17, 1898, the seagull opened to a full house. Vladimir wired Anton. Colossal success! Mad with happiness! Anton wired back. Your telegram has made me healthy and happy. Vladimir requested exclusive rights to stage Uncle Vanya next. The origins of the play can be traced back to the wood demon in 1889 a story that Anton and Suvorin had plotted out together. The original characters were based on the Suvorins, an elderly professor, his second wife, his daredevil son, two children called Boris and Nastya, and a French governess. The outline was as rich and broad as Middlemarch. Suvorin backed out, but Anton persisted. In 1896, Anton, by a mixture of alchemy and surgery, transmuted the wood demon into Uncle Vanya. He cut the cast by half and cut the melodrama. He merged a drunken Don Juan with the saintly doctor to produce a flawed Dr. Astrof. Uncle Vanya no longer kills himself. Now he cannot even hit a target at point-blank range. The ending went from sentimental reconciliations to the city dwellers leaving the wrecked lives of their country relatives behind. Anton gave it to Suvorin, who gave it to the printers. 
Previously, before Vladimir had requested it, the play had been staged everywhere but Moscow and held the provinces spellbound. In the meantime, Anton sent Pyotr Sergeyenko, a comic writer and old schoolmate, to sell his complete works to publisher Adolf Marx. The agreed upon price was 75,000 rubles for exclusive rights. Sergeyenko had erred by not getting the payment as a lump sum. Even if he had, many declared the deal a coup for Marx. Marx had made 100,000 rubles in the first year alone. The buyer for Melikhova also fleeced Anton. A timber merchant named Mikhail Konshin agreed to pay 23,000 rubles and 5,000 for fittings. But then, after complaining he had not sold his last estate, altered the terms. He would pay 1,000 rubles up front, give an IOU for 4,000 and pay the rest over time. Nevertheless, Anton's brothers wanted their due. Alexander bagged 1,000 rubles for his new dacha, while Misha had put two years' work into Melikhova for nothing. Anton promised Alexander money, but refused Misha. Anton was happy to be relieved from debt. He regretted planning his new house so thriftily and now splashed out on furnishings and the garden. He worked on his proofs for Adolf Marx, cutting out weaker humorous stories and purple passages. Anton often reacted to even good work with distaste by virtue of unhappy associations from the past. Minshikov told Anton posterity would disinter the work after he was dead, but Anton wanted to spare his public from his juvenilia. To Vladimir's request for Uncle Vanya, Anton agreed. He withdrew the play from the Mali Theater, where it was recently flagged by the Imperial Theater Committee. He then sold it to Moscow Art Theater, though rights were not exclusive. Anton then paid an unannounced call to Olga Knipper, living with her widowed mother and two uncles. The family was made of second-generation Russians and German-speaking Lutherans. Olga was spontaneous but organized. She could hike across fields, nurse the sick, behave genteely, or prance uninhibitedly. Before packing up Melikhova for Autka, Anton sent Olga a signed photograph of the cottage, where he had written the play that brought them together. On October 26, 1899, the Moscow Art Theater performed Uncle Vanya to triumphant success. Vladimir and Olga wanted another play. Anton sent Olga a jewelry box. His mind plotted a garden instead, and his creativity was hindered revising early work for Adolf Marx. Never had Anton been so detached from writing or so absorbed by horticulture. While Anton lived in Autka, Masha met with Olga often in Moscow, and the Chekhovs and Knippers drew closer together. However, Olga's relations with Vladimir Nemirovich Danchenko were more than professional. In Russian theaters, a leading actress tended to be the director's mistress, even if the director was married. The Moscow art was no exception. Masha offered to help Anton, writing him that. Nimirovich came to see me, stayed for a long time. We chatted a lot. And it occurred to me that I might lure him away from Knieper. A month later, Anton's writing spirit returned for a play and also a short story, The Lady with the Little Dog. A cynical adulterer Gurov on holiday in Yalta seduces the unhappily married Anna, only to find her image so haunting that he travels to the provincial town where she is stifling and turns an affair into an intractable involvement. Just as the reader wonders how it can end, the author talks of new beginnings and ends the narrative. The story appears to defend adultery and explode Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, for the lady with the little dog upset Tolstoy himself. The story also inspired a trend, as women began appearing on the promenade in Yalta with Pomeranians and leashes. As for his next play, Anton began taking notes for three sisters. The subject had deep personal reverberations. After the Golden, Markova, Ianova, Elintvarieva, and Shavrova sisters, Anton must have felt three sisters to be the fairy tale motif of his life. The Bronte sisters were another inspiration. Three talented, unhappy girls stranded in Yorkshire. A despotic father, a mother they do not recall, a brother, once their idol, now a drunken never-do-well. 
The result was the fictitious Prazorova sisters. While Anton attended a reading of Three Sisters in Moscow, marriage rumors swirled. Misha had said that an actress saw Vladimir raise his glass to the union of Nipir and Chekhov, perhaps Vladimir signaling his approval. Anton decided to revise the rest of the play in France and left for the warmer climate of Nice. There, he was disappointed that Olga was not writing him, until he discovered another Russian had been receiving his mail. On January 31, 1901, the opening of Three Sisters confirmed Anton as Russia's greatest dramatist. Olga wired news of the play's success. Anton arrived back in Yalta two weeks later. One of Anton's acolytes, Nikolai Yezhov, saw the cuckolded schoolteacher Kuligin as a caricature of himself and would not be writing about the play in New Times. Anton had a habit of portraying his friends and lovers on stage. In February 1900, the year before, Masha had taken Lika to the Seagull. According to Masha, Lika wept in the theater. I suppose memories unrolled before her the long scroll. At the Moscow Art Theater, Lika fell in love with Alexander Sanin Schoenberg, an officer turned stage director, and never spoke to Anton again. Anton was in love with Olga Knipper, by Anton's definition of love, anyway. In his notebook, he writes, Love is either the remains of something degenerating or part of something that will develop in the future into something enormous. But in the present, it doesn't satisfy. It gives far less than you expect. In spite of the obstacles for Olga's life as an actress in Moscow, and Anton needing to be in warm weather for his tuberculosis, the pair decided to face these trials together. Anton and Olga were wed on May 25, 1901, in the Church of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross in Tambov, Russia. The church was empty. The wedding had been made secret. Evgenia, Masha and Olga's mother did not learn of the marriage until the day off and were understandably upset. For the reception, Anton asked his school friend, actor Alexander Vishnevsky, to organize one in Moscow, to which the couple immediately dodged. Instead, they embarked on their honeymoon, a first-class boat journey down the Volga. On their way, they visited socialist writer Maxim Gorky. He was too consumptive for prison and was placed on house arrest. Gorky talked volubly, and when Anton and Olga finally blurted out that they had just gotten married, Gorky thumped Olga on the back. The couple reboarded the boat and chucked up the river Bele through wooded hills and docked at Ufa. From Aksionova, wickerwork carts took them over a hilly track six miles to their destination, a sanatorium. It had 40 little chalets and a house with 10 rooms. For the first time since childhood, Anton put on weight. Four bottles of kumis daily made him 12 pounds heavier by mid-June. Fermented mare's milk was easily digestible. It was also thought to raise the body's defenses against tuberculosis. Masha and Misha were still reeling from not being informed of the marriage. Vanya tried to smooth things over. Suvorin too was also hurt. By July, the newlyweds were back in Yalta. Anton made amends with his family, though Olga felt unwanted. She left for Moscow without Evgenia's blessing and returned to the theater, where Vladimir pressed Anton for another play. By December 1901, Anton suffered another hemorrhage and began taking creosote. Diarrhea and hemorrhoids followed. Dr. Altschuler used more drastic remedies, large compresses, some with cantharides, to irritate the tissues and disperse pleurisy. Anton begged Olga to secure leave from the theater for Christmas, but she did not come blaming her director. Anton and Olga desired to have a baby, but Olga could not give up her personal life to meet him and Anton could not travel to a cold Moscow. By the end of January 1902, Vladimir succumbed to Masha's appeals and Anton's hints, promising to let Olga go to Yalta. In February, Anton and Olga embraced after four months apart. Anton said, the five days were like a teaspoonful of milk after 40 years' famine. 
However, their time was clouded. Olga bled and presumed she would not conceive. On the return train to Petersburg, Olga collapsed and broke out in a cold sweat. She recovered somewhat and confided to a fellow passenger, who told her she must be pregnant. She had her doubts. However, she had lost weight and her head ached horribly. For treatment, she dosed herself with quinine and painkillers and bandaged her head. In March in Petersburg, Olga acted in Gorky's Petty Bourgeois, a play that required she run up and down stairs. In the wings, she collapsed in agony. Surgeons were sent for. Professor Jacobson and Dr. Ott chloroformed her and operated at midnight. Olga had been pregnant. Nobody telegraphed Anton for fear he would brave the cold and come to Petersburg, but because Olga's letters had stopped, Anton began to worry. Finally, in April, Olga wrote from the obstetrical clinic to explain what had happened, that the doctors removed a six-week-old embryo and that she hoped to be in Yalta on Easter Sunday. If this had been an early miscarriage, Olga could have traveled to see Anton right away. Anton, a good gynecologist and obstetrician, must have been perplexed. How could Olga have been six weeks pregnant when the nights she had spent with him five weeks previously were at the end of her cycle? Why did two of Petersburg's best surgeons operate in the middle of the night for an early miscarriage? Olga, without intending to, gave Anton other clues. There were pains in the left side of her belly from an inflamed ovary. This was no miscarriage, but an ectopic pregnancy, laparotomy and infection. An ectopic pregnancy, that is, when an egg becomes fertilized outside of the uterus, in this case, in the fallopian tube. The tube will rupture as the embryo grows. This rupture only occurs between 8 and 12 weeks from conception. Therefore, conception must have taken place when Anton and Olga were 800 miles apart. Anton remained caring, but distant. A ruptured fallopian tube and a damaged ovary meant they had little time and lesser chance to beget a child. They waited for Masha to relieve them of the Autka house and traveled to Moscow. Olga's abdominal pain grew worse. Anton was too ill to nurse her. She was now skeletal and given morphine. As Olga improved, Anton began to go out, visiting old friends like Olga Kundasova. Her mental health was better, and she encouraged Anton to heal the rift between he and Suvorin, a rift caused by political differences. Anton slipped the leash, traveling to the Urals in June. In July, the Stanislavskis offered Anton and Olga an invitation to stay at their house at Lyubimovka during their absence. The couple agreed. The house stood on the river Klyazma, northeast of Moscow, surrounded by forests and meadows. The family's servants, Igor and Dunyasha, attended them. Olga lay, swam and rowed. Anton fished and was fussed over by the neighbor's English governess, who spoke pidgin Russian. She fed Anton ice cream and wrote him affectionate notes, such as Christ be with you, Brother Anthony! I love you! Olga was too taken aback to interfere. Elubimovka's household and suburban trains imbue the setting for Anton's next play, The Cherry Orchard. Igor's clumsiness and precious language were absorbed into the character of Yepikhadov, Lily Glasby's pathos infuses Charlotte, and Dunyasha's name was borrowed for the fictional servants. Anton left for Yalta alone, implying he would return. He did not, leaving Olga enraged. His reply was a mix of resentment, fair-mindedness, and manipulation. But a month later, they declared a truce. Back in Moscow, architect Franz Schachtel had given the Moscow Art Theater an Art Nouveau update. Anton touched base with Suvorin, though neither enjoyed their meeting, and Anton left for Autka to get back to his desk where he wrote the short story The Bride. Olga was hurt to be almost the last of his intimates to read it. Anton never let her read his manuscripts. Concerning his process, what had taken Anton a day in 1883 and a week in 1893 took a year in 1903 a slowing down which marked not just the decline in his vitality, 
but the extreme care with which in his final period every phrase was chosen. The cherry orchard, through superhuman effort, was crystallizing too. The image of cherry blossom had recurred in his prose for 15 years. He first mentioned the title after news came that the cherry trees at Melikhova had been chopped down by Konshin, the purchaser. The play focused on the destruction of a family and their illusions, crowded by personal traumas. The plot involves feckless owners who face an auction. The merchant Lapachin, who urges them to sell land for cottages and then betrays them at the auction, has overtones of Gavriel Silivanov in Taganrog 27 years prior. The breaking string that punctuates Acts 2 and 4 was first heard in the Step Stories of 1887. Cherry trees that blossom in Act 1 recall those of his boyhood in Taganrog. The trees axed in Act 4 recall those of Melikhova. An elegy for a lost world, a state, and class. The cherry orchard nevertheless displays Anton's farcical invention at its richest. But as an old Chekhovian comedy, the ending is grim, for the old retain power, while the young are scattered to the winds. Contrary to Chekhov's gun in pop culture, Charlotta's rifle and E. Pichadov's revolver are introduced and do not fire. Opening night was set for Anton's name day, January 17, 1904. The theater was packed, and behind many seats were sickly-looking spectators, consumptives from Yalta. Anton was not in attendance for the first three acts, recovering after a night at the opera. Vladimir sent a carriage, and Anton was duly brought on stage. Into the center of a half-circle of distinguished academics, journalists and actors, to loud applause, walked a living corpse, hunched, pale and emaciated. At supper with the actors, Anton was showered with speeches and given presents of unique furniture, which he detested. What he wanted was a new mousetrap. Later performances did not bode well for the play. A black comedy was ill-attuned to the public's mood of jingoism on the eve of the Russo-Japanese War, declared on January 24th. Three days later, the Japanese sank the Russian Pacific Fleet at Port Arthur. Reviewers tended to dismiss the play as a political allegory about gentry overthrown by commoners. Gorky offered to publish The Cherry Orchard in print in his almanac Knowledge in exchange for 4,500 rubles. Anton accepted, but Gorky was delayed by censorship. Anton was still bound to the contract with Adolf Marx and had been sent proofs of the cherry orchard to check for publication. Anton lingered, waiting for Gorky to clear censorship. When Anton returned the proofs to Marx after stalling as long as he could, Marx published so fast that the knowledge almanac became unsealable. Anton, though badly embarrassed, demanded payment anyway. Even though knowledge faced insolvency, Gorky paid up. Anton and Olga were ready to leave for Yalta when rheumatic pains struck. To relieve the muscle pain, Dr. Taub administered aspirin and quinine, while Olga injected arsenic. As Gorky prepared to file suit against Adolf Marx, Anton and Olga left for Berlin. Waiting for them was Olga's brother Volodya. In Bedenweiler, they checked into the best hotel, the Rammerbaden. Anton seemed to improve. After two days, however, the hotel asked them to move. Anton's cough was disturbing the guests. They settled into a small pension, the Villa Frederica. Olga dutifully sent Masha bulletins. Olga writes, I beg you, Masha, don't lose control. Yesterday, he was so out of breath that I didn't know what to do. I galloped for the doctor. The doctor says that because his lungs are in such a bad way, his heart is doing double the work it should. And his heart is by no means strong. Don't let Anton sense from your letters that I have been writing to you, or that will torment him. At 2 a.m. on July 2nd, Anton awoke delirious. Despite a dose of chloral hydrate, he raved about a sailor in danger, his nephew Kolya. 
Olga sent one of the Russian students to fetch the doctor and ordered ice from the porter. Olga then chopped up a block of ice and placed it on Anton's heart. Dr. Schwarer arrived and gave him an injection of comfort and sent for oxygen. Anton protested that an empty heart needed no ice and that he would die before the oxygen came. German and Russian medical etiquette dictated that a doctor at a colleague's deathbed, when all hope was gone, should offer champagne. Schwer felt Anton's pulse and ordered a bottle. Anton sat up and loudly proclaimed, Ich sterb, I'm dying. Anton drank, said, I haven't had champagne for a long time. Lay down on his left side, as he always had with Olga, and died without a murmur before she could reach the other side of the bed. Olga presumed that she would bury Anton in Germany and return to Russia alone, but a flurry of telegrams from Russia, few of which expressed any sympathy for her bereavement, forced her to change her mind. She traveled to Moscow by train with Anton's body in a red luggage van. Awaiting her were Cleopatra Karatygina, Natalia Golden, and Suvorin, who collapsed to his knees. On July 9th, a procession of 4,000 began a four-mile walk across Moscow, from the station to Novodevichy Cemetery. Olga leaned on Vladimir's arm. The whole family, except for Alexander, who was doing errands for Suvorin, arrived from Yalta when the process was midway. At the apartment afterwards, Elika Mizinova joined them and silently stared out of the window for two hours. Anton's will of 1901 left everything to Masha, but the will had been informally drawn up and improperly witnessed. Olga, to the family's gratitude, renounced all claim. So did Anton's brothers. His entire state passed to Masha. Masha gave up school teaching, and assumed responsibility for the home at Yalta as a temple to her brother. Once memoirs and letters were published, it was her life's task to manage the archive. Through revolution, civil war, Stalin's terror and German occupation, she never relaxed her grip on the Chekhov heritage. She never married and died at age 94 in 1957.